Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Fraser History Museum. My name is Andy Trinan. I'm the president and CEO here at the museum, along with my good friend, our director of community engagement, Rachel Platt. Why are we here today? Well, this is the first of our Cool Kentucky programs, programming around our exhibit downstairs, Cool Kentucky. And magic is oh so cool. I had no idea how cool magic was. And one of our board members is here, Todd Spencer. We're in a meeting, and he's been kind of my partner in getting this whole Cool Kentucky exhibit up and running. He's the president of Doe Anderson. And he's like, you've got to do magic. There is such a cool Kentucky magic story that Frankly, I didn't know a whole lot about, but all of you obviously did know about it. So uh, welcome to the program. Magic is certainly cool Kentucky, Rachel. Right, exactly. So we know the names Lance Burton and Matt King. They're part of this cool Kentucky. We have a lot of catching up to do because you all know that if you're a member or have been a member of the Louisville Magic Club, raise your hand. Just curious how many in the room. So quite a few of you, that's for sure. Well, both of our special guests, as you know, Lance and Mac have ties to the Louisville Magic Club. We're going to be talking with them about the club and magic in just a few minutes. Yeah, they're both represented downstairs in Cool Kentucky. If you didn't get a chance to take a look at that before you come up, uh, before you came upstairs, I encourage you to do that on your, on your way out. We're going to have a great conversation. We're going to talk to them, ask questions. We're going to give you a chance to ask questions, and that's going to be... Uh, outstanding and then they're gonna perform magic I mean we're making history here this is actually I told Rachel like these tickets sold out in a hurry we thought we'd be all the way deep uh, in the room but then COVID happened and we had to kind of limit our numbers but uh, you were lucky you got in early it sold out and it is gonna be an outstanding event then after the event both have agreed to meet you uh, they're gonna greet over here at these tables they'll sign autographs if you'd like if you'd like autographs and they will take pictures if you'd like pictures. So what a, what a golden opportunity today. Absolutely. Um, before we bring out our guests, we want to say for all the magicians who were in our galleries today and did on the stage here, could you stand so we could give you a round of applause? A lot of names changed. Thank you all. It was so additive to have you all here. We really appreciate it. And I want to see in the seats when you all came in, we're going to talk about this in just a few minutes. There's a reason you have this. Um, these are some of the famous magicians who are buried in Cave Hill Cemetery. Some of the names you may recognize, some of you, you won't, perhaps. But we're going to talk about them and why they're important to the two people who are our special guests today. So keep that handy. And Michael Higgs, I'm not sure. There he is. Michael's here. Very good, with his son. Thank you, Michael Higgs from Cave Hill Cemetery. Um, They'd love to have you out to take a look at this, and we'll talk about a couple of things that happened with the two magicians on this page coming up in just a little bit. All right, I am not a magician. I cannot make things disappear, but I can make things appear. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt King and Lance Burton. Hello, how are you? Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, everybody. I'm gonna, we'll have you all have a seat. I have to laugh. I said, well, welcome to the fourth floor loft. We're not Vegas. And then when I came down to meet Lance, the first thing he said to me, will there be showgirls? <laughs> I said, you're stuck. Volunteers. With... <laughs> we'll volunteers. I said, had I known, I would have bought that feathered boa today, but I had no idea you needed showgirls. So anyway, and we were wondering, with the panel discussion with you two and then Magic, have you all sat down and done a conversation together? We haven't spoken in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I believe that. I don't know if I believe that. Um, we were wondering if we were making history by doing that today. And Andy, I know we're going to talk about the fact that yeah, take a look got, at the screens. Obviously, they have spoken in 10 years, and they have a long, long history together. We've got pictures up here of them performing together. Uh, at very young ages, uh, giving speeches at each other's weddings. Uh, there was a long, long history here, but let's, let's now just get into where we are right now. Lance, let's start with you because we don't have the opportunity to see you five nights a week anymore. Well, yes, uh, I retired from the stage full time in 2010. My last show was September 4th, 2010 at the Monte Carlo Hotel. And um, I left, and I didn't do any shows for seven years. 
and I shot a movie during that time and just sat at home with my dog and my cats. And You're just, back in Kentucky, and just though, right? Chilled. Well, this was in Las Vegas. I recently uh, moved back to Kentucky. I sold my place in Las Vegas, and I moved back in, to Kentucky uh, back in October. So I've been here almost a year. He was uh, asked to leave. <laughs> <laughs> they drove him to the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. To the right. state line. <laughs> and we should say that where you live in, in, is family, right? It's, yeah. It's, uh, so I, I, where I live, I moved back to uh, the farm where my dad grew up. This was a farm uh, down in Adair County uh, near Columbia, Kentucky. And this was the farm. This is my grandfather's farm. He bought in the 1930s. Wow. So it's been in the family for, you know, 90 some years. And um, that's, where, that's where I live. I built a, I built a house there uh, 23 years ago for my mom and dad. And uh, they passed away. Of course, uh, we lost mom 11 years ago. So it's been empty, but my plan was always to retire and move back to the farm. Uh, and, I never and believed you. You didn't, you just thought that was a story, I was Yeah, saying. I thought that yeah. was a story. Yeah. So the theater that I saw you in years and years ago in Vegas, is that? It's all gone. All gone. Once I left, they had to tear the whole thing down. <laughs> <laughs> Take it down, nobody no can replace you. No one can you. make a success after that. Yeah, I mean, that theater isn't, I mean, they, they built did, it for you, and then after, it, it's, Completely, they, they renamed the casino. They renamed the hotel, and the, they've 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 renovated the hotel. After I left, they 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 renovated the whole. It was hotel. a gorgeous theater. Oh yeah, it was a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, theater, and uh, I loved performing there. And Has I did, it been hard not to perform, or were you done? No, I was very comfortable walking away from from doing. That. I did that you know, basically my entire adult life, you know, your, your whole being revolved around that show every single night or two shows every single night. So, so I was, I was, that was all I knew. Over frankly. 10 years not doing it and this audience is going to get an opportunity yeah. to see you. Well, what, it's, it's going to be pretty rusty. Just <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why I'm not closing the show. <laughs> So, but uh, to bring you up to speed, currently, about three years ago, uh, I called some friends of mine and uh, said, hey, let's get together and do, a, do something. So my new show is called Lance Burton and Friends, and I do about half of the show, and then I have uh, uh, Fielding West, uh, Michael Goudeau and Keith West and the Illusioneers, so all good friends of mine, and, and, they, and I MC the show, so I'm performing all throughout the show, and also introducing other acts, and, and we've been uh, Wonderful. So your hand around. is still very much in it. Well, yeah, so we, we just started doing this three years ago. I think the first year we did one show, and then the second year we did like four or five shows, and then the third year we did uh, ten shows, and then COVID hit, so then right. that just sort of stopped everything but we've just now started to go out uh in july we went up to north dakota and played uh, a beautiful theater up in the uh, uh, indian casino up there so we had a good time and then last month we were in uh, uh michigan uh playing uh magician's convention we had a great time there and then in november we've got two shows in colorado one in uh, Oregon, and then we're doing, uh, it hasn't been a publicly announced yet, but we're doing a fundraiser in Las Vegas. Wonderful. Nice. Well, Mac, let's talk about you. You flew in from Vegas, so you're back performing because you had been shut down for a while, right? Yeah, I, I had unexpected 14 months off. Wow. Yeah, and uh, I'm not like him in that there was pretty I wasn't ready to do that. <laughs> uh, I, you know, if I, since I was 10 years old, I hadn't had more than three weeks off between shows. And so to do 14 months, and when I would do, when my wife and I would go on vacation, you know, she would, after like three days, she would say, I know what's wrong with you. <laughs> no one laughed or applauded for you in three whole days. Does she have, uh, oh, so, see that, look at, they're ready. I know. Well. I mean, the first day back, I was backstage, and the little music starts before the show, and I'm start bawling. I mean, it was really, really? oh yeah, it was. You did. Yeah, you wrote about that for Virtual Frasier that 
the shutdown really uh, impacted was, yeah, you. Yeah, it was mentally really hard for me. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, I, I know I'm, I had it easier than a lot of people, but it was still pretty rough not, you know, you just, that's part of who you are and you, I love it so much and it was rough not doing it, but I'm, I'm back doing it and so, excuse me, Mike. Uh, <laughs> One of the first performances, actually, I think the first performance that you did after the break or in the middle of the break was the video oh, that's yeah. downstairs in Cool Kentucky. Yeah, it was the same sort of thing. I, did we talk about this? Because my, my daughter, we were here in Louisville. My, I was with my daughter, and she came down with me to tape that thing. And it was that was only like three months into the pandemic, mm -hmm. I think. And so, and I hadn't done a show in a few months. And, you know, it, we were going to do it just for the employees, right. like seven or eight people, you know, standing around. And as we were walking through the museum, I saw that there was like a day camp or Our something. Our campers, yeah. It's like, come yeah. on. Yeah. And so there were, I don't know, a dozen kids there. And I said, do you think they want to see Magic Show? <laughs> <laughs> and so we've got those kids all up into the, uh, what do you call it, the speakeasy mm -hmm. that you have. And I'm setting up to do the show and my daughter looks at me and she's are you crying? Oh, wow. I'm like, yes, I'm crying because I get to do a show for 11 people. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a heck of a show. <laughs> just, just like your show in Vegas? Just like my show in Vegas. <laughs> oh, singers here. Zing, but there is love here. I know there is. <laughs> All right. Now here tell we us. Go. Now it's on. In case somebody's going to Vegas, where can they see you? Uh, I, so during the pandemic, I, I don't know, I got. COVID recruited? I don't know. I was I still had three years left on my deal at Harris, but I moved to Excalibur uh, down the street from Caesar's property to an MGM property. And so I'm at Excalibur uh, Casino and, and uh, started back in the end of June, I guess, or the end of July. I can't remember. I think the end of July. And <sighs> So how many years for you in Vegas? Um, I was at Harris for, depends on how you count. Uh, whether you count the last year where I didn't do shows, right. but I was still <laughs> under contract. Uh, I started in January 2000 there. I did 20 2000. plus years at Harris. And, and where, what years were you? And did you all overlap? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I was, I was, my first job was at the Tropicana Hotel in the Follies Brashear. So I was there, I opened there in 1982 to 1991. So it was nine years there. And that was... Two shows a night, yeah. seven, seven days a week. week. That oh was my the God! Yeah, that's that like a man the, does. The first two years, yeah, like a man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, uh, then I opened uh, my own show. Uh, what? Nothing. Was and that I, magic? <laughs> yeah, that was magic. <laughs> You'll find I'm well out. prepared. <laughs> <laughs> then I opened. Then I opened my my own show at the Hacienda Hotel in 1991. So I was there five years. That was a little small showroom. Uh, it was great. The South, it was a it was a great there. room for Magic too. It only seated back 400, 450, but it was a really it was a real it was an intimate room and it was it was a terrific. Were you there five years? Five, five years, years. Yeah. at the Hacienda. And was that and six nights a week though? Right? That was six nights. You a wised week. up a little bit. Yeah, and then but and then what happened was, uh, I'll tell you how this happened. The whole thing, back in the 80s and 70s. Every show was seven nights a week. The first show to go to six night a week work week was Siegfried and Roy. Mm. Their contract came up for renewal at the Frontier Hotel, and they said, well, the animals cannot work seven nights a week. <laughs> <laughs> we are happy, but the animals, <laughs> they are very temperamental, story. the tigers. So... We can't do seven, so we six nights. So they got the first six wow. six day work week, and then every show looked and said, "Oh, yeah, we could do that." And I feel like the animals slacker hey, paved the way for yeah. the people. My new That's sound crazy. guy was on that crew. Oh, was he? Yeah, I got yeah. good stories. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so seven days a week, then six days a week. So, that explains so the then seven year layoff. The the five day work week, I'm responsible for. Oh, okay. One time at the, so we were working six days a week at the Hacienda Hotel. And then one day, by accident, I got two days off in a row. It was Super Bowl Sunday or some, something. And they said, Lance, just 
because my normal day off was Monday. They said, go ahead and take Sunday off, too, because we're going to have a special event. And I went, fine. And so I did my shows, two shows Saturday. Then I had a weekend, Sunday and Monday. And when I came back to work on Tuesday, I felt so refreshed, you know, like a normal, like a real boy, you know, <laughs> I, I, like having a weekend. So that's what put it in my mind. So then when the guys came to see me to, hi, to, to make a deal to, to, to perform at, you know, what was going to be the Monte Carlo Hotel, they hadn't built it yet. But they came and said, we want you to come to our new hotel. The first thing out of my mouth was, okay, but I only do five days a week. And they went, fine. Oh, Woo! Boy, it worked. <laughs> yeah, that's, a similar thing happened for me at Harris. I was doing the Maxim. So I was at the little place called the Maxim before Harris. I had signed a two-year deal, and then two months into that, they announced they were closing the hotel. So that was pretty scary. But I was six days a week at the Maxim. And, yeah. But I had two months to invite other casinos in to see the show. And so I was able to con Harris into coming and working out a deal. And they said, we want to do exactly what you're doing at the Maxim. How many days a week is that? And I said, five. <laughs> <laughs> so that was smart. I just lied. <laughs> and they so didn't know. I'm is that at, industry I'm looking standard? at young people here. It's OK to lie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the parents have a lot of explaining yeah. <laughs> after the show that they have to tell them. As long as you don't get caught. Get caught. Get caught. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Don't, yeah. That's the last. Well, let's talk about the early days because we're looking up at, at some of these pictures. So, Lance, <laughs> because we, we sent out the thing that with Cave Hill, so Harry Collins is one of the names on oh, there. Oh, yeah. Sure. So let's talk about the early, wasn't it five, and that's when yes. your first encounter with Harry? Yes, yes. My dad worked at Levy's Building Supplies, which is on 12th and Breckenridge, and my mom worked at the Frito-Lay plant uh, in Louisville, out in Shively, making potato chips. So it was the Frito-Lay Employees Christmas Party, 1965, December of 1965. So we go, we go to the party, my mom, dad, me, and my little sister, and we're sitting in the audience. And now there was a guy that worked there at the Frito-Lay plant in Louisville named Harry Collins, born in Glasgow, Kentucky. Harry was, at that time, uh, a salesman or sales manager at, at the Louisville plant. Later on, because he was such a fantastic magician, uh, the corporate office of Frito-Lay in Dallas, Texas took notice of him and they created a job for him and he became the Frito-Lay Goodwill Ambassador. And all he did was magic from that point on. And they sent him to the Texas State Fair every year and every plant opening and every food snack convention. But he represented Frito-Lay, and all he did was magic from that point on. But when I met him, when I was a kid, he was still working as a salesman or sales manager there. So he's doing a magic show, you know, for this Christmas party for all the employees. And so he asks for a volunteer from the audience. Of course, every kid raises their hand, oh, pick me, pick me. And he looked right at me and said, that young fellow there in the red shirt. And I, I went up on stage, and then he, he did the trick where he reached behind my ear and he pulled out the silver dollars. And uh, that was it, you know? That was my first exposure to magic and that's where I fell in love with magic. So that, he, it hooked you right it then and there? hooked me right then and there. And then for, but I have to explain, I didn't understand what I was seeing. I thought that this man had real magic powers. Yes. And so every day for the next month, I would get up in the morning, I would go brush my teeth and I'd look in the bathroom mirror and then I would carefully check <laughs> every place where he had found silver dollars. Every, I did this every single day for like a month, searching for that money. That, where is it? That I was convinced was still there, but I, this man found it, and I had no idea. And here's that picture I just wanted to show you. And there, there. oh, that's, that's, I'm about 10 years old there. That's and that's Harry's table. That's Harry's table. That's my 10th birthday. And that's what I wanted for my birthday. I asked my mom for a magic table like Harry. Well, that's his Harry's old table. Harry had a new table made. That's the same one. I just put Lance the Magician on it. It's the, Mr. Magic was his stage name. And, uh, and I got that for my 10th birthday. And I'm about 16 there. Uh, but uh, so. So finally, my dad noticed that I was, you know, oh, checking. There's, Harry, right there's there. Harry and me, and that's we were doing a show 
at a school, and that was, I was probably about 16 years old in that photo. Uh, and my dad finally noticed me checking for that money. <laughs> and, and he finally, he looked, he said, he said, Lance, the man isn't real magic. It's not real magic. It's a skill the man studied and learned. And, and then I thought, oh, that's even better news. <laughs> Because if, if it's, you know, magic, then you're probably just born with it. But if it's something you can learn, then maybe I can learn. And Let's look here. So just fast oh, forward just a little bit. What, how old were you with your first appearance with Johnny Carson? That was my fourth appearance on The Tonight Show, uh, doing the sword fight and the card sword act. Uh, so, so my, that was, I was probably 25. And that was on, with Jay Leno. So that was in the 90s. So I was probably... In my 30s. Were you scared? I can't even imagine. How old were you for the first Tonight Show? The first Tonight Show, I was 21. You should tell that story. That's a good story. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. The first Tonight Show. Were you scared? Uh, I was, it was, I was, it was so fast. I didn't have a chance to be scared. It was, it was one of those surreal days that you didn't, you, you just go through and you just don't really think it's happening, but you just go with it. Carson or Rachel Platt? Who's more intimidating? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Rachel, definitely. <laughs> Well, tell us about the first. The first. You said it's a good story, so I I trust you. So, so, so when I was twenty, I entered the contest put on by the International Brotherhood of Magicians. They had this stage contest. This story is good, but that's going far back. Well, I have to say, (laughs) (laughs) so I won this contest, and then the next year they invited me back for their convention. So Mac and I go up to. Pittsburgh, oh, Pennsylvania, yeah. where they were having their convention, and now I'm 21, and I do the, where we're working at Tombstone Junction. So I do, I perform at the next year's convention. So there's a guy that sees me there, Bill Larson. Bill Larson and his brother founded the Magic Castle out in Hollywood, California, which is this gorgeous uh, private club that looks like a Victorian mansion. Uh, and, and so anyway, he hires me to go out to Los Angeles to do this big public show they put on every year. And it's called the It's Magic Show. Not to be confused with the Louisville Magic Club show, which is called It's Magic. So it gets confusing because the two shows have the same name. So anyway, I go out there anyway, because, because I was booked for the It's Magic Show, uh, I wound up getting booked on The Tonight Show. But that was an accident too. That was an accident too. The star of the show was Aldo Ricciardi great magician from Peru that year. Uh, and he was, he's an illusionist, and he was closing the show. He was the star of the show. So they call the Tonight Show, and they say, hey, we, we, we want to get one of our acts from our It's Magic Show booked on the Tonight Show. And they say, oh, great, what do you have? He said, we got this great magician from Peru, Ricciardi, great illusionist, and he's fantastic. And they said, ah, we just had Doug Henning on last week doing illusions. What else do you have? <laughs> so, so the producer, Milt Larson, says, well, we got this kid from Kentucky. He just won this international award for his act. He does sleight of hand and mad birds. We'll take him. Wow. That's how it happened. <laughs> so, so I get to L.A., and I find out that I'm booked. And I said, oh, well, that's, that's good news. And so... So the producer of The Tonight Show comes to see It's Magic on preview night, which was the night before we opened. So this is October 27th, 1981. He comes and watches the show because he wants to make sure he hasn't booked a turkey on The Tonight Show. That could get you fired in Hollywood. So he comes and watches the show. It's the first time I'd ever performed on the West Coast, so I got a good reaction from the audience. Nobody had ever seen me. And so it was like a surprise. All the magicians that were there were like, oh, who's this? So anyway, I got a good reaction. He comes backstage. For those of you who never saw that act, it's the greatest magic act of my generation. All right. Well, that's nice of you to say. Lovely. That's nice of you. (laughs) There's a payoff coming. (laughs) I think they have a deal. We just don't know about it. <laughs> Mac, let's talk about your early influences. Your first magic influence, if I'm not mistaken, was your grandfather. Uh, 
Yeah, but there's more to this story. Oh, oh, wait, wait, okay. I'll, I'll speed it up. Right. I interrupted right. the story. I'm sorry. This is, yeah, that's not the good part of the I'll, story. I'll speed it up. He I'll, started a little earlier than you anticipated. I'll man. speed it up. <laughs> so anyway, he comes to me. He comes backstage. Jim McCauley was his name, the, the talent coordinator for The Tonight Show. He comes backstage, and he's, so I meet him, and he says, very good, that'll be great. He says, how long is your act? I said, 12 minutes. He says, you can't do 12 minutes on The Tonight Show. It's probably going to wind up being five minutes, six minutes. Bring the whole act with you tomorrow. Do the whole thing in rehearsal. We'll watch it, and then we'll figure out what, part, what you're going to do on the broadcast. And I said, yes, sir. And I showed up in NBC, Burbank at the studios, set up, did the rehearsal, and uh, no, there's no audience. I'm just rehearsing. It's just the band. I'm, I'm, I'm using a recorded music. So it was just the band sitting in the audience. But they were applauding, so it was nice. It was a nice rehearsal. So I'm standing on stage after the rehearsal. I'm talking to the stage manager, a very nice fellow named Kevin. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see a hand coming towards me. So, you know, you just reach up, you shake the hand. And then I look up, and there on the end of the hand is Johnny Carson. So I'm like, oh, how are you? you know? <laughs> and you're 21, and, Yes, right? I'm 21. I mean, that's crazy. And so now I'm meeting Johnny Carson. Now, he's very kind. He's very nice. He's very complimentary. He's I, really I, into magic. He's too. Really, he loves magic. He was a magician growing up as a kid. I don't think I knew that. He was yeah. a, as a kid, and he that was his first performing was not stand up comedy. He was doing magic shows as a teenager, and he still still even up into his sixties and seventies continued to practice magic. So he loves magic. He's very complimentary, and he says, you know, I love your act. Oh, thank you so much. And and anyway, he goes away. We don't, we only talk for like sixty seconds. Then he leaves. And then Jim McCauley comes over and he says, Johnny was watching your rehearsal. Johnny loved the act. Johnny said, let the kid do the whole 12 minutes. Wow. So they put me on. I was the first guest on the show, did the whole 12 minutes. The act finishes. The audience applauds. It went well. They cut to Johnny Carson. The camera's here. Now, what Johnny Carson, I didn't know this till years later, and I went back and watched the tape. The camera's here. Performance space is over there. Johnny's looking over there, applauding. They cut to Johnny, close up of Johnny. What he's supposed to do is he's supposed to go, That was terrific. We'll be right back after this commercial message. He doesn't do that. I finish my act, the audience applauds. They cut to Johnny. He's doing this. He just keeps doing this. He doesn't look at the camera. He doesn't stop. Never came the off. The director has to cut back to me, taking a second bow. So he personally gave me, not only did he personally say, let the kid do the whole 12 minutes, he made the director cut back, give me a second bow. Then they cut back to him. Then he looked at the camera. And then he, instead of going right to commercial, he then spent like a minute saying, wow, that was a fantastic act. Ed, what did you, oh, yeah, I heard you talking before the show, blah, blah. And he said, boy, that was beautiful. That was a, that was a beautiful, classy act. That was the, the Best I've ever seen. And he says all this on camera. Oh my and then gosh. he says, we'll be right back after this. So now I have this tape of me doing this on, on kids' tapes were these cassette things <laughs> <laughs> that we put in machines back in the day. So now, so now it, was, it, was, it was, but that was Johnny personally. That was his way that, of saying. His way. So that was my, my launch pad for my career. And... But, but what I always tell the young magicians when I, when I tell that story is, I want to add is, yes, I was 21 years old. I was very young when that happened. And that started my career. And that led to me getting my first job in Las Vegas. And it was my first time on national TV. Yes, but the thing you have to understand was, even though I was young, I had a thousand performances under my belt. I had done that act 1,000 times Probably in front of more. a stranger. Probably more. So you were ready for the moment. Because we, were, we were doing, uh, leading up to that, we were doing three shows a day, seven days a week, down at Tombstone Junction in Cumberland Falls, Kentucky. We were doing 21 shows a week all summer long. Wow. 
For three summers. For three summers. So, and that's how an act becomes a polished professional act, is that repetition, just doing it and learning and making mistakes. So even at 21, you were ready for it. Did you ever say to Johnny Carson after that, did you have that moment to say, thank you? I, mean, I, 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 I got to meet him a number of times over the years back on the show, but it was usually very short and quick. And, and I never got, uh, I was always working all the time, so I wasn't in L.A. I was never one of the guys that got invited to his house. Some of the close-up magic guys would get invited to Johnny's house in Malibu to do magic night, sit mm -hmm. around with him in his living room doing card tricks and stuff. I never got, I never got to do that. How generous of but him, he though, was, for he that. He was with very you. generous and very kind to me, and my entire career, I can trace back. Every, everything I've moment. ever done, I can trace back to that moment. And, and so I always thank Johnny every day. And, uh, and, and you, wow. th you th that was intentional. He knew exactly he knew what, what he was, he was doing. doing. He, he was a he pro. He was launching your career. He was a pro, and he knew what he was doing. He exactly, he is exactly right. And the Tonight Show back then, it wasn't like nowadays where you have, you know, all of them 100 plus. networks. 700 options. He was the one. And well, but it was, there were only three channels three. or four, maybe. Yeah. And he was the only late night show right. yeah. doing that on late night. So they didn't have that competition that yeah. they have now with the late night shows. Everybody in America who was watching TV after the late news was watching that show. And yeah. everybody. And they, they, that was their goal. Their specific goal was to present. I had this conversation with Jim McCauley years later, who be, later became the producer of the show. Their, their, their philosophy was we want to present excellence. We don't care what you do. If you're a stand-up comic, you're an actor, an actress, a singer, a, a, an author, a cook, a, a jazz musician, if you have excellence in your field, that's what we want to present. An opera singer, they, don't, they didn't care about you know, the ratings. Who, who, who's the most popular actor to book on? They want excellence. And that's, Interesting. And that was their philosophy back then. All right, let, now do you, Mac. We're let Mac get, talk. Yeah, we got some, I, I was I noticing. I conversation. Like I apologize. All right, it. you take it's him through it. It's a great story. It, it is a, a great story. story. It's it's a it was story. a great story. Right. Yeah. All right, Andy, you take Mac through through his. Well, uh, you, first of all, do you want to add any color to that? Because you, you've heard that story multiple times, and you were. That doing... was mostly true, it seemed like. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your grandpa and, and, and how you fell in love with magic. Um, yeah, I didn't have Harry Collins, but I did have Pax King and Elwood Huffman, my, both my grandfathers. And um, I have a very vivid memory of my grandpa, Pax King, in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, picking me up and sitting me on his kitchen counter and uh, taking out his handkerchief with his little K in the corner. He was a very dapper fella at Pax. And, uh, Taking this, is how long ago it was, taking a kitchen match, you know, that he used to light his stove, and wrapping it up in his pocket handkerchief and putting it in my hands. And I, he said, break it, and I broke that match in half. And I felt it, and I heard it. And he said, now open up the handkerchief, and that match was unharmed. And I had seen it, or felt it, heard it. And then he explained how the trick works. So that was the first trick I ever learned. And so you weren't looking for things in your ears. No, I wasn't like looking for it. He immediately told me how it worked. I didn't have that delicious month of checking behind <laughs> my ears. Or, but he, the, uh, and then my mom's dad, Elwood, um, actually had a few magic books at his house. He, he was in, this, my dad's parents lived in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. My mom's parents lived in Greenville, Kentucky. And I would go visit, and he would maybe do a trick or two for me, Elwood. And then I would beg him, because now I know there's secrets, right? Not just your grandpa's magic. There are secrets that you can learn. And I would say, how do you do that? How do you do that? And he said, well, the secret is in one of those books. And so he would, I would spend the rest of my visit pouring through these you know, he had like four magic books there on his shelf. He was the town eccentric in Greenville, Kentucky. He owned more than one book. Yeah. Uh, 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 that was nasty. So, he was the town eccentric. I mean, everybody knew Elwood Huffman. Uh, you know, he owned a shell service station, and if you would come in, he would have riddles for you and do tricks for you. And 
So uh, I'd, I would look for these tricks. And you know, it was a great education, right? I, I'm looking for that specific trick, but I'm also just reading other tricks. And I'm going, oh, that would, I'm going to come back to that and learn that trick. That looks really cool. And so and it, it took me a long time to figure out that that was really a scam. It wasn't to learn magic. It was a scam to get me to read. Mm. And so it was pretty, <laughs> pretty great uh, little teaching thing from my grandpa Elwood. So that's, that's how I got started. And now you, you spend a lot of time promoting literacy. Yeah. I, I, in, in Las Vegas, I do a book drive every year. I mean, I think it probably partly stems back to that. I do a book drive every year, and then I go to at-risk elementary schools during Nevada Reading Week and do magic tricks and talk about literacy, and every kid goes home with a book. Wonderful. So Love it's that. It's a nice little thing to do. So when did the plaid, because when your pictures come back up, people will see you as, I couldn't be more than what, five or whatever, and you've got the plaid suit on. That was a, that's just a coincidence. I was really <laughs> surprised to find that little five-year-old No, I said you're wearing King plaid, plaid even as a, a child. In a plaid jacket that matches the. That might be the reason. Well, that might be the reason, I, although here's the re real reason. It's, it's a costume designer. Uh, when I, 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 I say in the show, I say that these suits, that this suit belonged to my grandfather and just a little tribute to my grandfather's. But, uh, but I did initially use one of my grandfather Elwood's suits in the show. And then I, you know, I got it out of his attic and I doctored it up for my show and then you know, he'd already worn it, worn out. I, it wore out pretty quick. I found one more, used that in the show. And then uh, I went to Lance and said, hey, who makes there's your the picture, tail? By there's the picture, by the way. The we, oh, we, the we have to yeah. look at that. I just want to make sure, okay. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Man, what a snazzy dresser <laughs> that kid was. Uh, so I went, I called Lance and I said, hey, who makes your tuxedos now for the show? Because there's a lot, you know, there's secret pockets and stuff in there. And uh, <laughs> so sorry. I thought you were retired. Louisville Magic Club's here. <laughs> are you, we're going to get kicked out, you think? No, Cody Clark's going to kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> One of them's cool. open on the first floor, so. Uh, so Downstairs. <laughs> Oh, yeah. There's, there, is it open with all the so secret pockets So we've revealed your secret so, a little right. bit. So, so he introduced me to this woman, Margaret Rose, a costume designer in L.A., and uh, she came to a number of my shows, and she drew some costume design ideas, and then she sent me a bunch of, or gave me a bunch of swatches, and they were all plaid, and I'd never worn. My grandfather's suits were not plaid. They were just old suits that I thought were cool. And she said, I feel like this is good for you, and I'm like, all right, I'm, whichever way the wind blows, I have really no, you know, I, I feel like my whole show is an accident. So <laughs> I didn't really have much to do with it. It's another, <laughs> I feel like it's another piece of evidence for, you know, evolution over creationism. I didn't create it, it just evolved. <laughs> but now it's your signature. But, and, and it beca became that, yeah, yeah, over the course of, you know, 30 years or so. So when did you two, what age were you all when you met? So you're both... 14. 14. 14 years old. And this is... Was I, it with the Louisville Magic Club? It was with the Louisville Magic Club. It's because... Back then, you had to be 14 years old before they would let you join the International Brotherhood of Magicians or the Louisville Magic Club. Now, I had been to a couple of meetings of the Louisville Magic Club as a guest when I was younger. The first time I was... Yeah, Harry probably took Harry me. took me as his guest. He was one of the founders of the Louisville Magic Club back in the, the 30s. So, uh, but but uh, I had been a guest, so I had attended a meeting but I wasn't a member. I had to, you had to wait till you were 14. Then, then I joined, and that, that's where I met Mac. Yeah, and so Caulfield's, uh, which is now, right right down used, the used to be on 3rd Street. Right. Yeah, it's right, right across the now. street yeah. almost. But it used to be on 3rd Street. And 308 I, South 3rd Street. There you go. <laughs> was the original address. And so, uh, and there was a little magic counter there. And so uh, once I found that, I would go, my, you know, we lived in the South End at that time, but uh, in Valley Station. but. Every so often, I could calm my parents into coming up to Caulfields, and I'd you know save up some money and go buy a trick or two. And once I became 14, they said, "Hey, you should go to Louisville Magic Club." The guy behind the counter, and I said, oh, "There's a magic club," and so I go to the. <laughs> 
it was at, they met in the YWCA, which was at 3rd and Broadway. And this is how different of a time it was. My, I was 14. My mom drives me. Uh, we had moved uh, to Cherokee Road by that time. But I, my mom drives me to the YWCA, just lets me out on the corner, doesn't go in and check to see what's going on. <laughs> she just lets her 14-year-old get off, get out of the car at 3rd and Broadway in 1970, <laughs> whatever it was. 74. It? Yeah, 74, 73. And so, uh, and go in and hang out in the basement of the YWC with a bunch of strange old men. <laughs> <laughs> So luckily, I it was reputable. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily. <laughs> and so I go down into the basement of the YWCA, and I'm, it's, I'm a little early for the meeting, and I'm excited, and I go in, and there's a group of people standing around, and they're obviously watching somebody do a trick. But it's before the meeting had officially started, and there's a crowd of people, and then they kind of applaud, and the crowd sort of disperses, and it's like, it, it was like in the movies when you see the first revelation of Jesus, right? I mean, the crowds part, and there's like, oh, <laughs> and there's a big white light, and there's Lance Burton, the 14-year-old Lance Burton is the one enthralling all of these older, I mean, it seemed like at the time that they were all 90. <laughs> And they were our age. Yeah, or less. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, uh, and so I'm like, oh, my God, there's another kid. And so we were the only two kids, really, in the Louisville Magic Club at the time. And so we were forced to be friends. But That's you performed, <laughs> I know, in a lot of the pictures. Give us just a quick, because we want to get to some audience questions and then let you all perform. Sure. Give us quick places that you all performed together or things that might trigger something with the audience. Say, oh, I remember that. Oh, the merry-go-round. See, I didn't grow up here, so I'm sure oh, it is. Oh, you know, that's a strip club. Okay. <laughs> well, no wonder Seventh, I didn't know. <laughs> 7th and Barry Boulevard. Is that where it was? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the merry-go-round. Do you have a brick from there? That, I do. I got it Friday night. Oh, you did? I brought it Friday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, when we drive around, I drive around town now, I just I go, oh, I did a show in that church. And, oh, I remember that, <laughs> that yeah, school. Yeah. So, but I mean, what has surprised me with you all, because you could be competitors. I mean. We are. But you, <laughs> but when I've been dealing with you up to this program. Why do you, you think he left Harris? <laughs> <laughs> you all defer to each other so much. You're so respectful of each other. And I just wondered, I mean, was there, I mean, you could be considered competitors where there might not be that wonderful relationship yeah, that but you I have. mean, I, I think one of the ways to get, when you're a kid, one of the ways to get good at something is to have a friend who's interested in the same thing, right? And so when we, I'll tell a quick story that I think is interesting. Um, the only other, I've never had any other job except a magician, except one summer when I was in college, I worked uh, as a backup chef at 610 Magnolia. And I was, uh, yeah, if I wasn't a magician, that's what I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Ed Garber, who started 610, uh, I had gone in there to have dinner, and then I did a trick for him, and I started doing close-up magic in that restaurant, going table to table. And he asked me if I had any, I, you know, any friends who would be interested in working in the kitchen. And so I said, I'd be interested in working in the kitchen. So I did that. So I was there one afternoon uh, pre prepping stuff. And a guy comes in and says, hey, we just got a phone call. The guy wants to know if there's a magician here. I assume that's you. Uh, so I go to talk to this guy. And he says, my name's Rick Stevens. I have this uh, park or this yeah, entertainment park in uh, Cumberland Falls, Tombstone Junction. And uh, we're looking for a magician. Are you the magician who was at Max and Irma's? And I said, yeah, I had worked doing close-up magic at Max and Irma's. He said, any chance you could come down tomorrow and audition? Ed, can I get off tomorrow? All right. I said, do you mind if I bring my friend? He said, I don't care who you bring if you're here tomorrow. So he and I went down there and auditioned for this job together. And so we spent the summer you know, living in a house trailer uh, and behind this little theater there, and so we would do three shows a day, seven days a week, 
And then we had access to that theater at night. And so he would do stuff, and I would sit in the audience and say, no, that flashed, or I can see how you did that, or that's, try it this way. And he did the same for me. And so wow. having a pal help you, uh, you know, watching you and critiquing you makes a giant difference in it, whatever you want to learn. And I, so, and I always feel, felt like, you know, he was on The Tonight Show how many times? 10 with Carson, 10 with Leno. That's 20. 20. Okay. So, it's tied. So, and uh, I was never on the Tonight Show. <laughs> so, on the Letterman Show, but not 20 times. <laughs> and uh, I felt like that was always because I was a better coach than he was. <laughs> <laughs> you were the superior coach. Yes. Yeah. 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 It, it, it is. I mean, it's like Malcolm Gladwell, Outliers, or the Beatles, Lennon and McCartney. I mean, there is somebody that pushes you. Is there a reason that Kentucky is, I don't know, punching beyond its weight in, in, the, in the field of magic? There's a lot of great magicians that lived here or from here. You know, Mac, me, Kerry Collins. Yeah. And we got, we got young Cody that's, that's making a lot of waves in magic. And those that were at the show on, on, on Friday night at the, uh, that we did the Louisville Magic Club at the Ursline Arts Center, we saw a young lady there, 11 years old, first time on stage. Oh, wow. She was fantastic. And she rocked the place. She's a member of the Louisville Joanne. Magic Joe is her stage name. So, so we've, we've had a lot of really terrific magicians from this area. It's just having influences and people but to see. And, I don't and know. I don't know why it is, but huh. it's just something it's in the water. water. <laughs> it's the bourbon. And so, yeah. one, one quickie, too, and then we're going to get audience questions. We have a couple of presentations, and then we're going to get to you all with the, with the magic. Let's talk about the... Um, we had three people on the sheet with Cave Hill, and you did what was called a broken wand ceremony yes. with Thomas Tobin. Yes. Why was that important to you that Thomas Tobin was recognized, and who was he? In Thomas case Tobin don't know? was a magician uh, from England, and he, back in, he made a lot of waves in magic over a hundred years ago. It was uh, the dates are escaping me at the moment, but around. Uh, the 1890s, early 1900s, he was involved in producing uh, several seminal magic illusions that we are still using today. Things to do with mirrors and optics. Kick he, his ass, Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> Kobe. <laughs> Tobin was, uh, from all accounts, a child prodigy who who was trained in chemistry and, and uh, what the physics or, or you know a science, and so anyway he but he 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 moved to London and he got involved in magic and for like three years he was only involved in magic but he invented and was involved in like three or four really influential illusions who, who are that are still being performed today and whose offspring are still being performed today. So he was only in his 20s when he did this. Then he disappears from the record. Nobody knows what happened to him. Nobody knows where he went. Nobody knows when he died. Nobody knows nothing about Thomas Tobin after that. After those three years, he's just this total mystery, enigma. My friend Jim Steinmeier tracked down Thomas Tobin. Turns out he came over to America with another performer. He wasn't a very good performer himself. He was kind of behind the scenes guy. They, they had a show they were doing. They ran out of money in Louisville, Kentucky. The other guy goes home. Tobin decides to stay in Louisville and make a home here. He was hired by the university and became a university professor and was quite well known in, the, in Louisville as a university professor, a teacher. Never mentioned magic. Nobody knew anything about his connection with magic. And then he died uh, fairly young in his, in his 40s. And, uh, but he was a beloved figure in Louisville. And Cave Hill Cemetery donated the plot. And he was buried there. And uh, the people attending his funeral were the people from the university. Totally forgotten. And uh, there was no stone or anything. So 
Jim Steinmeier tells me this story about Cave Hill Cemetery. I, I, and I said, I know, I know where Cave Hill Cemetery is. My mentor, Harry Collins, is buried there. So then about uh, th three or four years ago, we're here in Louisville for a big magic convention. Mac and I and Keith West, who I mentioned earlier, and a couple other guys, we go over to Cave Hill to do a tour. We go see Muhammad Ali and Harry Collins and Colonel Sanders. The rest leave. And then Keith and I, I said to Keith, I want to ask about Thomas Tobin. So I go to the front and I said, can you tell me where Thomas Tobin's buried? And they look it up and they go, yeah, here, we got this guy here. He'll take you over there. So they took, took us over. We found the spot. No marker, no nothing. It's just dirt, grass. So we decided he needed a, he needed a monument. And so we, I was back a couple years later. To, we were doing a show at the Palace Theater, the Lance Burton and Friends. And we took that week and we uh, erected a monument. We had a whole ceremony and the, and the Louisville Magic Club was there. And part of the, normally when a magician dies, this started, in, this started after Tobin had died. This started in 1926 with Harry Houdini. They did what's called a broken wand ceremony where you take the magician's magic wand and you break it to symbolize him passing on from this mm. world to the next. So, and we did the broken wand ceremony. It was a beautiful ceremony. Yeah. I, and raised the money to get, it, to get it done, to get the stone and all those. Yeah, well, we just, we, we paid for it out of the show, yeah, out of our show budget, so. But, uh, but it was a great event, and, and the stone's there, so people, if people go to see, if you ever take, if you've never been to Cave Hill Cemetery, it's a really uh, fascinating place to go, and there's a lot of rich Louisville history there, and like I say, you know, Ali is there, and uh, Harry Collins, and Harry is just several, is just maybe 40, 50 feet from Colonel Sanders. Right, very good. Well, thank you for that. And I want to see, do you all have any questions? We only have a couple, then we're doing presentations. We've got to get to the magic. First three to raise their hand, get their questions. Oh, dear. <laughs> Stand One. up, sir. If we can bring you the, why don't I bring you the mic? That might be the there best we thing. Let me just have you stand up. Is that Michael Hotwa? Yes, it is. Hey, Michael. How are you doing, Lance? Good to see you, sir. Um, you, I'm sure you're familiar with the movie The Illusionist. Yes. The, can you tell me if the, tr the trick about the pear tree or the orange, I can't remember whether it's a pear no, or an orange, okay. yeah, so he but the, the tree that grew out of? Yes. Is that a real trick? That's a real trick. It was invented by a man named Robert Houdin. His, his original name was Jean, his whole name was Jean Eugene Robert Houdin. And he was uh, the father of modern magic. He was a French magician, very well known, very famous in France. And the name Houdin, he was so influential, there was a young magician named Eric Weiss that read his autobiography. And he loved Houdin so much, he wanted to be Houdin. He wanted to be like Houdin. And someone told him, if you add an I to the end of the name, in French it means like that thing. So he changed his name from Eric Wise to Harry Houdon E. Houdini. Ah. So that was Houdini's hero, and that was a real trick. And uh, I've seen the actual prop. The actual one Houdon used was uh, they had on display at the Skirball Museum in Los Angeles uh, a, a couple of years ago. Yeah. We, we saw it there. And it's good to see you. And for those of you who don't know Michael Hotois, he was one of my professors at the University of Louisville theater department and was at, uh, the, the head of the theater department and is a fantastic scenic designer. And the only, I remember when Mikhail Bereshnikov came to Louisville and danced with the Louisville Ballet. I saw the show, he did, what was it, Giselle? Was that the show? What's that? Okay, I, I got the name of the show wrong, but. Michael did, am I correct? Am I remembering right? You did the scenic design. And it, was just fa it was this beautiful thing floating in the air, like a, was it a stone, a boulder? A th it was a three-dimensional, but it was, it was just this beautiful, but uh, what a great uh, scenic designer Woo. Michael is. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Well, in full circle, I have a picture of Mikhail Baryshnikov in my audience that the Courier uh, Journal had taken from that performance. From that performance. Yeah, that yes. was big, that was big, big That was news. huge when yeah, Burishnikov came here. Okay, tell me your name. Emily. Okay, and what's your question? How long did you and Marty perform together? I, I mean, not my, 
Matt. How long did you all perform together? Yeah. Or how many times have you all performed together? Yeah. I don't know how many times, but I mean, we started doing sort of shows together when we were like 16, 16 or something. When I got my drivers, we live on opposite sides of town. So once I've turned 16, I could drive over to visit Matt. We started doing shows together. So from the time we were 16 to when I left town, Yeah, like 21, 21 something like that. 21. In Vegas, so, do you ever perform together or no? Did you ever? Some, did who? In, in Vegas, did you all ever have a show? Oh, joint? we've been on shows together, yeah. sure. Okay. Yeah. 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 Usually, you know, charities. Yeah, we've done those kinds things. of things. Fundraisers and, yeah. One more. Did you have another one? You good? Okay, thank you, sweetie. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for being here today. I'm wondering what you think are the, the biggest issues in the profession and the art of magic today, and how do you think we move forward and solve some of those issues? Well, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, Thank you. The, the point we are today is the, because the Internet is so pervasive, when young people, when young people get interested in magic, they, can, they don't have to go to the library. They can go right to the Internet and see a lot of magic and learn a lot of magic because there's instructional videos and stuff. So, so they can navigate that. But... A lot of times when you're just starting out, it's really helpful to have someone who knows the ropes to be a mentor, to advise you, to be able to say, listen, I know that trick's very flashy, but you're not going to get a lot of use out of that. Spend your time working on this. this. This classic will give you the building blocks and the skills to be able to learn magic and present it in front of an audience. And, and this trick will help you with your public speaking skills. And so that sort of hands-on mentorship, that's why we, we're trying, for like the Louisville Magic Club, we are actively trying to recruit young people to come to the meetings and start learning magic. Because there's nothing that replaces that, that sort of in-person mentorship. Yeah, and it's really tough because, I mean, people see that, that they, I mean, there's, to me, that, that's, a, that's the, a big issue. I mean, there's also, you know, should there be more women, more minorities in magic? And... You know, that's kind of above my pay grade to figure out any kind of what we're going to do about that. I think it's getting better. But things have, when, but, we, were, when we were teenagers and going in, on competitions, you, you would have 30 kids competing in a youth contest. Maybe, maybe you'd have one little girl doing magic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes none. Sometimes, it was, most time it was all boys. Why do you think that is? It was something that was just, that was little boys were encouraged to do, and I think little yeah, girls think weren't. Girls you not. know, kids got, a ma little boys got magic sets maybe for Christmas or for their birthday. Versus the little and, girl. And, and a girl but, didn't, as a, that wasn't a tradition, you know, but, magic sets and erector sets were yeah. you know, like boy toys and then dolls. And but, Nowadays, for the last 25 years, I've sponsored the youth group, youth program, which is now with the International Brotherhood of Magicians, the Lance Burton Teen Seminar. So we, we do a free, it's just free to the kids, uh, like two-day seminar. Uh, and, and now, and today, we have at least 30 percent, 30 to 40 percent of the young people are girls. Good. Doing magic. That's great. So it's much more uh, uh, popular and accepted uh, uh, little girls, and we encourage that. Very so good. So, like in all things, we're making progress. Yes. But we're not there yet. <laughs> not, yeah. And now we have two presentations. Yeah. Uh, if we could get um, Ken Scott with the International Brotherhood of Magicians to please come forward for our first presentation. And you want to come together, what? and Michael Raymond. Hey. Oh, the, come together, all right. Hey. And then Michael, just so you know, is the president Ken, of the Louisville Magic Club, but in this capacity, representing the Society of American Magicians hey, as their regional <laughs> vice president. Oh, you know what? Michael, let me get, let me get so, that microphone. So, so in, case, in, case, in case that wasn't clear, I was in, Michael is the president of the Louisville Magic Club this year. It's, it's a different, is it a one-year term or two-year term? It's a one-year term. One-year term. So Michael, it's a dictatorship and, now, right? And, a, well. <laughs> and, and, and Ken is the president of the national, International right. Brotherhood of Magic, which there are rings, clubs. International. In, international. So, like, we have a ring... Uh, IBM ring here in Louisville, ring 64, mm -hmm. but there's one in Cincinnati, there's one in Lexington, there's several in California, 
Right. We, we are, the Louisville Magic Club is an assembly of the SAM, which is Society of American Magicians, and a ring of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. So we are a combined club, which is kind of a rarity in magic clubs. And uh, so I am here as the uh, president of the Louisville Magic Club, but in this capacity, I am a regional vice president of the Society of American Magicians. So I am representing the president of the Society of American Magicians today. And it's kind of weird because I'm getting to present some awards to my friends. <laughs> and, um, you know, thir when I was 13 or 14 years old, I went to Caulfields and Mr. Mac King here told me about the Louisville Magic Club. So if I would have never met him, I would not be here today in this position. So Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm first going to present a uh, presidential citation to Lance Burton. And this is what the presidential citation says. Um, it says, be it known that with the powers granted me by the Constitution of the Society of American Magicians, and as a representative of the National Council of said society, I hereby issue this presidential citation to recognize and congratulate Lance Burton for his support to the art of magic, humane animal treatment, and the society. Lance was an inspiration to many through his live shows and television appearances. Lance's willingness to share his magic with other magicians gave him a special place among his peers. His support to the art of magic and care of rescue animals in so many ways at the local and national levels is truly extraordinary. Lance is a great source of pride to all who know him, and he epitomizes the ideal standards set by our founders and our motto, magic, unity, and might. Witness the hand and seal of my office during the term of my presidency, 2021 to 2022, Thomas Dante Gentile, SAM National President. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Thank you. And like I said, this one is really special to me because he introduced me to the Magic Club. The Society of American Magicians, September 12, 2021. Be it known that with the powers granted by me to me by the Constitution of the Society of American Magicians, and as a representative of the National Council of said society, I hereby issue this presidential citation to recognize and congratulate Mac King for his support to the art of magic and the society. Mac was an inspiration to many through his books, live shows, and television appearances. Mac's sense of fashion gave him a special <laughs> roasted place among his compeers. His support to the art of magic and care of Fig Newtons in so many ways at the local and national levels is truly extraordinary. His cloak of his invisibility must be seen. Mac is a great source of pride <laughs> to all who know him and he is set forth by the founders of our motto, magic, unity, and might. Witness the hand and seal of my office during the term of my presidency, 2021 to 2022. Thomas Danti Gentile, SAM National President. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> and I have one more presentation to give. This one is to the Fraser Museum. And this is uh, written as a poem by our pre national president. Cool Kentucky Exhibition, Louisville, Kentucky. Magic is the oldest art form of entertainment. Magic is on stage or up close within a containment. Magic has been known for generations of 4,000 years to focus. Many ears recognize abracadabra and hocus pocus. Magic has stemmed wars and settled disputes. Magic has brought many recognition and tributes. It is always a pleasure and an honor to say, tis a great to see you all here today. I hope you do not mind a little ditty about what is happening in your vicinity. We welcome all who have shared in this incredible feat, sharing a day with known magicians whose time shared can one cannot beat. 
the Louisville Magic Club Assembly Number 215 at the Fraser History Museum, September 12th, 2021, for many to see them. The Fraser History Museum is known to assist with cool Kentucky exhibits many of us cannot resist. To include time with Lance Burton and Matt King sure does beat a straitjacket escape <laughs> or suit scripting. One is humane and the other can become invisible. Notable local superheroes who have become world visible. They share their experiences, their wisdom and travel and hopes the path of magic or pets worlds do not unravel. The Society of American Magicians appreciate all that you do. I award you the certificate saying thank you. National President Tom Gentile and the Louisville Local Assembly number 215 conveyed this date by Regional Vice President Michael Raymer as seen. I hope you have enjoyed this attempt at a ballad or poem. May it bring a smile on the way back to your old Kentucky home. Thank you so much. And do we have real fast? Oh, I think we've got one more presentation here real fast. Uh, wait, there's more. There's more. <laughs> ah. Dude, can I hey, guys, that? how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I had President. to put the Mr. T starter kit on. This is a, a chain that goes back with the International Brotherhood of Magicians. Uh, next year, we're going to be 100 years young uh, for IBM, one of the largest organizations uh, in the world for magic. And I'm honored to be the president this year. Uh, for this year and for 22. Uh, and to these two guys here do so much for magic. But we have a few things we want to first present to you guys. First, this museum. How about a big hand for them? This is amazing. Thank you. So like Michael, it, you know, with being a president, there are some kind of cool perks to put these things together and uh, get to fly up here and see everybody, so this is neat. So this is from the International Brotherhood of Magicians. It's a presidential award, uh, be it known that with the powers granted to me by the Constitution of the International Brotherhood of Magicians, I thereby issue this presidential award to the Fraser History Museum for your dedication to teaching and displaying history in addition for showing people the importance of the art of magic with its deep history and roots here in Kentucky. Witness the hand and seal of my office during this term of presidency. Signed, Ken Scott. This is for you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It, w it wasn't a poem, okay? It wasn't a poem. <laughs> they showed me up on that. Okay. Thank you, guys. And this is, you guys, for what you're doing for magic is great. Thank so you. Thank you. Very you for, much. I hope you do more of this. All right, for the two buddies over here. All right. For Mac. Yes, sir. Should I come over there? Yes, come on over. <laughs> you don't need fish on you, do you? Okay. Not at the moment. <laughs> Thanks. Spoil it for everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Like, well, uh, when, when I knew that I was going to be able to do this, I thought, I'm going to be kissing up to these guys. I got here this morning. Yeah, just, just for you. Ken too. doesn't live in Louisville. <laughs> All right, so here it is. The International Brotherhood of Magicians Presidential Award, uh, be it known with the powers granted to me by the Constitution of the International Brotherhood of Magicians, I thereby issue this presidential award to Matt King for your dedication to the art of magic and your, de your decades of the longest running show, one man shows in Las Vegas to over two million fans. The IBM is so proud of your success and what you have done uh, and what you continue to do for our organization. Witness the hand and seal of my office during the term of presidency. Signed, Ken Scott. P.S. Matt King, you are my favorite magician unless Lance Burton is here. <laughs> Trade me sides. You guys are you used to awards. You guys both are used to the awards. I know, I know. Um, and he was, he was talking about the award that you won for IBM. That was you, you, uh, the gold medal, yes. The gold medal. And those are not given out frequently. So, uh, yeah, day or day, yeah. So, congrats. This is for you, my friend. International Brother Magicians Presidential Award. Be it known with the powers granted to me by the Constitution of the International Brother Magicians, 
I hereby issue the presidential award to Lance Burton for your dedication to the IBM for being our world ambassador to magic. That's right. He is our ambassador to magic right there, this guy right here. And for your course, for all your work you do for the juniors of magic with the Lance Burton Teen Seminar, you make the art of magic a better place. Witness the hand and seal of my office during this term of presidency, side Ken Scott. P.S. You are my favorite magician unless Matt King is here. <laughs> Let's get a photo. <laughs> and I, I signed up, I think, three new members on Friday. He signs up new members all the time. Thank you. And thank you, well, guys. We're going to move the table over. Yep, we're going to oh. move the table, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Uh, hey, it's time for a little bit of magic. Yes. Whatever you feel like. Yeah. We don't need to move. We're going to have this? Are you sure you Matt King. Okay. And then we're going to have Lance. And then we're going to have Matt King again. So let's get, let's get right, him set hey, up here. Howdy. <laughs> howdy. I am Matt King. And I uh, thought I'd start out today with a rope trick. Thank you. <laughs> this is actually the very first magic trick that I ever saw any magician do. My grandpa taught me this when I was a little boy. This used to be his jacket. <laughs> My grandmother made this. I know. <laughs> anyway, I guess since I, he would always say the rope had two ends and one center, then he would cut off one end of the rope. He'd say, now I have a piece of rope with just one end. <laughs> it made sense to me, too. <laughs> he cut off that end. He'd say, now I just have the center of the rope. Thank you. <laughs> He cut off the middle like this. He'd say, now I have no middle and no ends. OK, I wasn't that stupid. I could tell he still had a piece of rope. Wait, no, 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 no. You, you weren't watching carefully. I'll start over. Howdy. I'm Mac King. All right, back to the rope. My grandpa, he'd cut the middle like this. He'd say, now I have two exactly, <laughs> mine aren't even close, two exactly equal pieces. I don't know how I did that. My grandpa's, his two pieces, his were like this, quite a bit closer. I'll start over. It has two ends. Whoa, it worked. Two ends and a center. Do me a favor, right here in the front. You watch this end of the rope. Keep your eye on that end. You folks over on this side, you watch this end over here. Wait, you're watching this end, but it's already over here with the other one. So I have a piece of rope. It has two ends and a center. Oh, thanks. The, uh, the ends are up here. The center's down here. But if we take the ends off, You can't find the center. <laughs> could be there, could be there. No one knows where the center of the rope is till we put the ends back. And there it is. Right in between. Wow. You see my teeth? Yeah, they're sharp, like a small rodent. A rodent of unusual size. Yeah. I cut the rope using the vermin-like teeth. So we have two pieces of rope tied together with a knot. Knot. You can keep that. That's coated in spit. All right. Let me get this. Whoa. Sorry, Mike. Let me get these scissors, I'll really cut this thing apart. I cut the rope into halves, the halves into fourths, the fourths into eighths, and the eighths into sixteenth, thank you. <laughs> Kentucky Public School? <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I was going to say little pieces. <laughs> Jefferson County Public School. <laughs> That's not a joke. <laughs> All right, for the big finish, I wave my hand over the 16 little pieces of rope. I say, whoa, 15. <laughs> Stay there till you learn it. 
I wave my hand over the rest of the little ropes. I say the magic words. Uh, Fraser Museum rocks. <laughs> Those are the magic words today. I say the magic words, Fraser Museum rocks, and they all come out in one piece. <laughs> I'm not kidding. These knots come right off. It's a piece of rope. Two ends, one center, and that's the rope trick. Wow. Hey. Hey. There you go. Yeah. Enjoy yourself. So uh, I haven't introduced, oh, I don't need to. He's right here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I haven't introduced Lance Burton in a long time. I'm very excited. Uh, <laughs> and it's uh, my oldest friend uh, in magic and my, uh, my, my best friend for, uh, since we were 14 years old, so almost the last 15 years. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Lance Burton, master magician. Al. <laughs> he's, 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 he's kidding. We're, we're not really friends. Okay. Um, so, hey, I'm excited to be here, and I wanted to do something special for you guys because it's a special uh, day to be here with my oldest friend, Mac, and, and then I got to think, normally, if I was coming out in front of a group like this, I'd come out and I'd try to do a magic trick, show you something amazing, but I want to do something really special. So I got to thinking about it, and I have an idea. Remember... A couple of years ago, there was a guy on TV doing magic. He wasn't just performing magic, though. He would come out, he would demonstrate a trick, then he would turn around and show you how the trick worked. He would expose the secrets to the magic. You never saw his face, though, because he had the th mask magician. That's right. That's what he called himself, the mask magician. Have to be honest with you. A lot of magicians were really mad about those shows. Not me. I learned a lot of new tricks. So, <laughs> Of course, he's not doing those shows anymore. We uh, killed him. And, uh, <laughs> starting to feel bad about that. So today I'm going to make up for it. I'm going to do my own little teach a trick segment in the show. This is the part of the show where you all get to learn how to do a magic trick. First, I'll demonstrate the trick so you can see what it looks like. Then I'll show you how it's done. When you get home, you'll be able to amaze your friends. It's a simple trick with a purple handkerchief. All it takes is a squeeze, a snap. It changes into an egg. The handkerchief jumps into the pocket. That's the trick. Okay. Thank you. OK, now, I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Lance, sure. You can do the trick. You, you did this for a living for 30 years. I'll never be able to do it. Folks, it's really easy once you know the secret. The secret to the trick is right there. Oh, you thought it was going to be something clever. Very simple. You need two handkerchiefs. Make sure they're the same color. You'd be surprised. You also need what we in magic call a magician's egg. Now, a magician's egg is not an egg that is laid by a magician. It's a wooden egg or a plastic egg. It's hollowed out. That's all you need to do the trick. Now, before you start the trick, you have to do what we in magic call your presets. This is what you do before you come out on stage. One of the handkerchiefs goes into your pocket. The wooden egg goes into your pocket. Now here's the important part. Come out in front of the audience. Don't start the trick right away. Chat with the audience for a minute. Tell a joke if you know one. If you don't know a joke, confess to a murder. <laughs> the right hand can then slip into the pocket and take out the wooden egg. The audience will never notice this because they're not watching you. They're contemplating your felony confession. <laughs> In magic, this is called misdirection. Bring the egg out clipped between the two middle fingers and the palm of the right hand. In magic, this is called palming. As a young boy, I used to practice this in Walmart. <laughs> 
Some of you made up your own joke. <laughs> now you're ready to start the trick as far as the audience is concerned. Slowly poke the handkerchief into the egg. In magic, this is called poking the handkerchief into the egg. <laughs> Snap your fingers, show the egg to the audience, reach into your pocket, take out the extra handkerchief, smile, bow, the audience goes crazy. That's it. But, oh, okay, now, yes, one little tip. If you do this trick for your friends, make sure they're all sitting in front of you. Okay, if anyone is behind you, don't do the trick. They will see the hole in the egg. They will not be impressed. If that should happen, though, if someone should notice the hole, remain calm. Do what I do. Remove the hole from the egg. Then pretend to crack the egg into a glass. That way you don't end up with egg on your face. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Whoa, thank you very much. What a nice audience. Bless you. Wow. I... What, 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 thank you so much. What a nice audience. I, I wish I had a better act. Okay. Uh, there's young people in the, hi, how are you? There's some kids here. Uh, you guys uh, together? No, just strangers? Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, is a uh, what's your name? What is it? Marshall. And how old are you, Marshall? Ten. Ten. Very good. And is this your wife here with you? <laughs> no, no. Sister? Friend. No. Friend. Very good. Nice. Nice to see you, Marshall. Stand up a second, Marshall. Step right up here for one second. Just face the audience there. Yes, I, I remember the 60s. That's beautiful, Marshall. Hold, hold on, though, Marshall. I love your shirt. I love the tie-dye. There's just one thing that's bothering me about it. Let me... Hold on, Marshall. Let me just... I think he liked that one. I'm not sure, folks. I'm not sure. Here, Marshall, wait. Don't go. Now, now, what, what, what's your name? Ivy. Ivy. And how long have you known Marshall? Uh, since, first grade. since first grade. Nice. Now here, uh, Marshall, Ivy. I'm, I'm going to give this to you guys. This is a magic ribbon. I'll tell you how this works. Take this home with you when you go to sleep tonight. Put this underneath your pillow. Okay. When you wake up in the morning. There'll be a $5 bill there. <laughs> just, just remind your folks, the magician said so. Let's give these two kids. Thank you, Marshall. Give them a hand. Oh, fantastic. Oh, this is a nice one. It's, uh, Let's see, I've got one more, yeah, I've got one more thing I could, I'm going to do for you guys. And uh, this one is, uh, this is the first time I've ever had to pick a volunteer with a masked audience. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's usually easier. You, get, you look at people's faces and see what their reaction, and you pick some, I'm, all right, I'm going to take it. There's a, hi, how are you? What is your name? What is it? PJ. PJ, do we, have we ever met? We have, okay. <laughs> Where did we meet? Tombstone Junction. Tombstone Junction, no kidding. PJ, PJ from, from Dayton, Ohio? Oh my gosh, give me a hug. How are you, sweetheart? Oh my. That's so it's good to see you. I didn't recognize you. You got the mask on. Okay. I'll, I'll pick somebody else. I'll pick. <laughs> Let me find somebody I don't, maybe I haven't ever met. Let me go back here. Let's go to the back. There's a. There's a, hi, how are you? Nice to meet What is your name? Sandy. Sandy? Mm -hmm. And have we ever met? Yes. We have. <laughs> where, where did we meet, Sandy? Uh, Tucson. Tucson? <laughs> Tucson, Arizona? Right. 
okay, would you help me with this trick? Could you come up on stage? Could you leave your pocket? But is this your husband here? Uh, okay, we won't ask. Okay, <laughs> give Sandy a hand, folks. Thank you, Sandy. In Tucson, was I doing a show there? No. Okay, we'll talk later. All right, Sandy. Sandy, your, your part is really easy. You are going to assist me by holding this envelope like this. You're going to be like a little table, just like this, hands underneath and fingers curled. Can I take this off? Yeah, you certainly can. Yes, thank you. Do you want it? Yes, you want to put it right there? That's great. Perfect. That's even better. Hands underneath. Perfect, Sandy. And just tilt it down just a little bit, just like that. I'm going to reach in. I'm going to remove these cards. Let that slide. Don't, don't, don't grip. Let me just pull that out. There you go. There you go. Good. And I'm going to put that right there. There. Perfect. Now, Sandy, this is a test of your imagination. I want you to imagine there are four playing cards there. That's the easy part, okay? There really are four cards there. But I want you to imagine. <laughs> Don't get ahead of me, Sandy. Imagine those are the four queens. That would be a good hand if we were in Las Vegas playing poker. Okay, now, if, Sandy, if I were to reach in there and I were to remove two of the queens, in your imagination, which two did I remove? I'll give you a hint. These two are the same color. So it could be red or black. So in your imagination, which did I remove, the red queens or the black ones? The red ones. That would be the queen of Diamonds and the Queen of Hearts. That's exactly right, as you can see. She's perfect. She got that question right. Now, Sandy, Queen of Hearts, watch me now. Queen of Hearts, Queen of Diamonds. I'm going to mix these two up so you don't know which is which. I'm going to return them, but I'm going to flip one of them upside down. In your imagination, which one did I turn over? Uh, the, diamonds. the Queen of Diamonds. So in other words, out of the four cards, the one that's upside down would be the Queen of of diamonds. Sandy, I don't want you to think that that was some sort of sleight of hand trick that I somehow <laughs> flipped that card over at the very last second. That's why I brought the queen of diamonds from a different colored deck of cards. In fact, I didn't even bring the other queens which just goes to show you have a great imagination. Now, Sandy, you can still feel something in there, can't you? You feel something in there. Inside that envelope is a DVD of my new movie, Billy Toppett, Master Magician, available on Amazon. And we won... Uh, winner of the best family film at the Wild Rose Film Festival 2016, and that is a gift for you for helping me. Thank you so much for helping with the show. Give this nice lady a big hand, would you folks? Okay, folks, now you are going to see, uh, I'm going to bring back to the stage a magician who is in my opinion, the finest stage magician working in the world today. My oldest friend, Matt King. Oh, man. What a lovely... Thank you. Right there. Right there. I'm Matt King. It's very swell. Uh, boy, uh, this woman here, what, what's your name? Yes. Mary Gwen. Mary Gwen. Now, have you seen my show before? Oh, and hand that rope to Mary Gwen. She and I are going to try a little magic trick. Stretch it out nice and tight, Mary Gwen. That's good just like that. I'm going to throw these scissors and cut it right in half. <laughs> yeah, hold it in front of a stranger. That is a good move. <laughs> Actually, Mary Gwen, uh, can you stand up for just a sec? The rope has to be kind of, yeah, and that's great. You and I and that piece of rope are going to do one of Houdini's most famous tricks. This is called the Houdini Challenge Naked Rope <laughs> Escape. <laughs> I just want you to take off your clothes and tie me up. 
kidding, of course. You don't have to tie me up. <laughs> and who are you here with, Mary, Mary Gwen? Is it, you with this gentleman here? Uh, oh, did you break your wrist? Uh, I can fix that. <laughs> it has two ends. <laughs> and what, what is your name, sir? David. David? And uh, are you married to each other? I don't know. <laughs> event this is. Uh, this is perfect. Why don't the two of you join me on stage? Give them both a big hand. Mary, De Mary Gwen, David, let's see. I think uh, Mary Gwen over here on this side, David over here on that side. I have little gifts for each of you for coming up. You each get big goblets of vodka. <laughs> hold that if you would, Mary Gwen. Actually, can you hold it on the base like that? And uh, same for you, David, with your good hand maybe. And uh, yeah, just with one hand, just with one hand. Can you, uh, but maybe squeeze, to, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I wouldn't want you to have to balance. That. Okay, yeah. So that way everybody can see the water part really good. Don't drink that. <laughs> so uh, Mary Gwynn, when you were a little girl, did you ever go fishing? Yeah. yeah, my grandpa used to take me fishing when I was a little girl. And he would say, <laughs> my grandpa would say, in order to catch fish, you have to have three things. You've got to have the proper fishing pole. This is my grandpa's original fishing pole. This is like over 100 years old. You've got to have a place to put the fish once you catch them. That's what you folks are holding. I'm going to catch fish and drop them right in those glasses of water. Third thing that you have to have to catch fish is, of course, the proper bait. Fig Newton. <laughs> A lot of people don't know that's the best bait. You bust off about a third of a cookie. That's all it takes is a nice, long, squishy, skinny piece of squishy Fig Newton. Here's what you do. You roll up your squishy, skinny piece on the hook. Just kind of roll it and squish it. Once you get that Fig Newton to stick on that hook, you could fish anywhere you want, David. We're going to fish out here in midair. And we're not looking for just any fish. We're catching goldfish. And there's a goldfish right in front of this kid's head over here. See if I can snag. I got him. Oh, yeah, he is a fighter. David, hold that glass over here and check him out. Come off of there, buddy. He is a fighter. He doesn't want to turn loose of that hook. I don't <laughs> This is my Louisville goldfish. <laughs> the finest magician alive. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, he's there. <laughs> Uh, well, that, that wasn't as good as it could have been. <laughs> He's a good fish. Uh, do you know the rule here at the Fraser? About fish? Yeah, whatever you catch, uh -oh. you got to eet. <laughs> eat. No, he's still there. He's still there. <laughs> he's just a little scared now. <laughs> That's why the water is kind of cloudy. <laughs> Hold that one just like before. <laughs> I, I can't show you how to catch fish out of midair. That's my grandpa's secret. But I can show you how to freak out your friends. Just need some gravity. <laughs> Get a carrot and a carrot peeler. I just took the red eye last night. I'm a little out of it. <laughs> you peel off a strip of carrot so it looks just like a goldfish. All right, there's work to do here. That, that looks more like the worm, <laughs> little fishing worm. You gotta use your teeth for this. <laughs> These used to be my grandpa's too. <laughs> you trim up the carrot. Yeah, good shot. <laughs> you trim it up so it's vaguely goldfish shaped. Now, pretend like that glass of water is your friend's fish bowl and that there are a bunch of goldfish swimming around inside. Here's what you do. You hold that carrot sliver behind your fingers. You don't have to do this. I'm just saying, should you care to? <laughs> Nobody knows it's back there. When you're ready to freak out your friends, you reach down amongst their fish, pull out the carrot, you go, I got your goldfish. <laughs> Before they get a good look at that carrot, you quickly pop it in your mouth. <laughs> I'm guessing you ate that fish. <laughs> oh, man, hold the glass over here. <laughs> oh. Uh, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. How, how long have you been married, David? 35. In those 35 years, you ever have occasion to use one of these? Any idea what it is? It's a faucet. Uh -uh. Cloak of invisibility. 
It's right, it's the Mac King Cloak of Invisibility. I put this on, boom, you can't see me. As soon as I put it on, bang, I'm invisible. I wear it, I disappear, put it on, I'm gone. Rendered invisible by the Mac King Cloak of <laughs> I don't feel like doing it today. <laughs> today I feel like doing a card trick. Mary Gwynn, are you a gambler? No. Oh, sure you are. But <laughs> jackpot, right? <laughs> yes. Please take those cards. Count ten of them right here, one at a time. There you go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Perfect. Yes, ten. Hand the rest of the deck over to David, if you will. You folks have met, right? And uh, put those ten someplace where I can't get to them. I may need your help. <laughs> you have a busted wrist. Okay. Uh, ten more, David, please, sir. Ten more. Yes, sir. There you go. One at a time so everybody can see we're not doing anything tricky. There you go. One, two, thir three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Ten cards for Mary Quinn. Ten cards for David. Trade me these for those. And uh, I'm sorry I made you deal with the bum hand. <laughs> Put those in your pants pocket. I'm being specific with you because I'm scared. <laughs> All right, so here's a right front pants pocket, and yours are just left, oh, up your sleeve. Oh, that was, that fooled me. <laughs> I certainly thought you'd put them somewhere else. <laughs> All right. So, that's like almost inaccessible. All right, I'm gonna sneak into your sweater <laughs> without you feeling it. I'll sneak out three cards. I'll show you how to do this after the show. <laughs> I'm going to sneak. I'm not sure whether it's up the sleeve or down the sleeve. I'm going to, I'm deciding. I'm going to sneak in there. I'll sneak out three cards. You won't feel it. Then I'm going to sneak those same three cards into your pants. <laughs> You're going to feel it. <laughs> so three cards will fly invisibly through the air from her <laughs> sleeve. into his pants pocket. Now, to do this, I need the aid of a secret device, which I keep behind the curtain. I'm going to go get the device. While I'm gone, you tell everybody the secret to the 30-plus years of marriage. I'll be back in about 10 minutes. <laughs> so uh, talk it up. Number one. Who? <laughs> David. Did you feel number two land in your pants? Three cards have flown invisibly. Get ready, this is gonna blow your funky minds. Right now there are two people on stage.
move. Now there are three. You may think it was just a nice couple up here telling you about their 30 plus years of married bliss. But I will prove I walked invisibly <laughs> among you. Keep your cards where they are, please, sir. Bring yours out of there, please. Yeah, I might have pushed them a little further. Okay, you got them. Count them here, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 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 Seven warm cards. <laughs> Three are missing. Bring them out of there. Make sure you get them all. I don't want to have to go in there again. <laughs> Count them here, please, sir. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Hey, thank you very much for your help. Re that was really funny. Thank you so much for your help. Watch your step. <laughs> Thanks for coming up. Oh. So, uh, I got one last thing. A lot of people say that there are no cures for the hiccups, but I've invented the Mac King hiccup cure. It really works, too. Get a big grocery bag. You spilled water all over the place. Get a big grocery bag, and you put it over your head. Don't everybody leave. <laughs> put the bag over your head, and then you spin around. Till you're really dizzy. Whoa. Hiccups are gone, and so am I. We hope you had a great time today. Matt King, ladies and Let's gentlemen. Burn. Thank you so much. <laughs> there you guys. Thank, Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Good job. Good job. We live. I got to sit and watch. I haven't watched you from out front that close in many, many years. Same crap, right? You oughta, you oughta. <laughs> well, thank you all. All we can say is great magicians and better friends. Thank you. It's yeah. been a pleasure. Thank you thank all you, very Jim. much. Uh, thank you. Matt King and Lance oh, Burton, ladies and gentlemen.